That's Drew. And that's Mike. And that's Justin Purser. Justin Purser is a writer, director, and filmmaker who released his debut feature film, and 2 f by c in December of 2019. The documentary, which details the life of identical twin professional surfers, CJ and Damien Hobgood, was how Mike and I initially got in touch with Justin. Little did we know that his eclectic career is one that includes work in areas ranging from professional surfing, to YouTube, to advertising, to music videos with major labels and artists, and much more. Justin, thanks so much for your time again today for the second time recording with you. We really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to hearing more from you about your origin story. Yeah, no, thanks for uh, having me again. Um, I think the third time is going to be the best time. So I'm looking forward to the next one. <laughs> I, I agree because I think we've are all thought the next time will be in Waco. Yeah, so, that's yeah. true. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. So how are you doing today, man? I am good. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier uh, to Drew that today's the first day that you can see the sky again in, in Los Angeles. So, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So, well, you never, you never had to have that in uh that was never a thing in Florida growing up for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Growing up in Florida, you, well, sometimes you can't see the sky, but not because of smoke. It's more just like <laughs> pissing rain. Um, so this is just a trade off. The difference is, is like, so I haven't really gone outside too much in the past couple of days because you know, it's the air quality is so bad. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, you don't, I, I didn't surf or do anything. I, I kind of wanted to, but I just was like, I don't want to breathe in. Yeah, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to go. I, and you guys have smog warnings and stuff like that. So this is much worse than a smog warning, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, they just, you know, you can see the air quality on, on the, on the weather app. So it tells you that it's, it's not good out. So um yeah but in growing up in florida you had a different side of the uh the the spectrum of national events or weather events which is the hurricane world right and and you kind of have two sides of it you hate seeing hurricanes but at the same time as a surfer you love seeing hurricanes yeah um hurricanes in florida and, and on the east coast is uh if you surf it is it's a blessing and a curse mm -hmm. um i remember being a kid sometimes if and actually one of the benefits of being a surfer and um growing up as a surfer and hurricanes is you you actually study them just because you love because you want to know more so you become almost like this hurricane expert even to this day like i have people that live in florida or their parents do and they'll ask me like what i they'll like what do you think this one's going to do because i've learned how to like track them and i've learned how to deduct the media hype and you know find the direction because we used to we would chase them like if we saw one like coming up Miami and like we knew this thing's just going to cruise up the coast we would go down to Miami wait for it to pass and then just move all the way up. there was a couple times we drove all up to North Carolina we would just follow it like so because awesome. if you're behind it by a couple of days and it's just going up the coast the waves are like the next day after hurricane passes that's when it's good because it sucks the wind offshore yeah and you still, and you still mm -hmm. have the um the wave so you know, always, we'd always, the dream was if we were like, what if they could figure out how to just like harness one, just hold it off the coast, like for like, <laughs> like a couple of weeks, just sit like, I don't know, can they just put like a lasso on it and just hold that thing? <laughs> like just sit there and spin just like, you know, like 50 miles above you would be, uh, it'd be amazing. But yeah, so, um, and then the downside of a course of hurricanes is, you know, the devastation, but also just the like, there's such a disruption and a pain in your butt in your life, even if you don't get you know, thankfully you don't get any devastation, but just the like, no electricity for a few days, like, you know, uh, sometimes no water, like that's the- The chaos the of life too, just yeah. not, get, not, not being able to get gas and go to the grocery mm -hmm. store and everything's gone and all that kind of craziness is, is just the what if, even if the spaghetti model has it getting some way. Do you see the uh, Atlantic today? Oh, wow, no. Those are all active? Yeah, it's pretty yeah. active. Yeah, uh, yeah. pretty active as of today. But yes, uh, Drew and I definitely had the same when we were living in Florida. We would yeah. always be checking it out and we'd be going. We used to surf one of our favorite hurricane spots was right near where you grew up, a little bit further north because you were by Tables, right? You were down south in the Coco, uh, or you were further south than that. Yeah, like Satellite Beach in the Atlantic, yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. So like Pelican Park or further south? Um, well, I lived, I technically lived in, in the Atlantic, um, 
but I went to Satellite High. So, um, which, okay. you, know, I don't, you know, those cities, they're literally like three miles apart. So it's all just sort of one giant thing. So, um, yeah, so I was down there. Where did, where did you guys go? We went, we, we went to college in, um, or, or land, or sorry, we went to surf um, just right when you come off of 528 into Coco, mm-hmm. um, you take a left at the Wendy's. Yep. And then you go straight to the dead end of that road turn right and there's uh, what's the park called um I think it was cherry downs cherry downs it's called park? cherry downs park oh yeah. right up in Co- right. Cocoa beach yeah right yeah, right, yeah, Cocoa beach. Beach. right across from Cocoa yeah. beach elementary yeah yeah right there so a great place to park easy and it was always a little bit smaller than down south but mm-hmm. because it was right at the end of the cape you got a little bit of uh you know disruption from the wind so. yeah yeah uh, Cocoa Beach Pier sometimes would be really good. Like yeah. uh, the Halloween swell when it was actually like too massive. It was like tw- literally 20 feet. Um, a lot of guys went to, <laughs> um, went to Cocoa Beach Pier and it was like six feet, but it was unbelievably perfect, um, which is like the only time you'd ever see Cocoa Beach Pier that, that size. So, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, I was I was always curious what it was like down in South Beach because I remember seeing a picture in a magazine from a hurricane swell in South Beach and it was like right on shore, like mm-hmm. crazy beach break, just this guy getting totally shacked in it. And it was like this turquoise color water. And I was like, that looks so awesome, but not what I would picture from South Beach at all. And also just such a juxtaposition of cultures to me. It was like, you see all those rent to rent chairs and rent umbrellas going down yeah. the beach. And then this guy's just getting... Yeah, shacked out of his mind. What was it like when you went down there? So I never got it. I never got it that good. I, I was there one time when it was pretty good. Because um, we also used to do the Gulf, too. So like if a hurricane went up to the Gulf, go over there. Yeah, and, I did that yeah. once in a Siesta Key one time. It was a blast. Yeah, that, I always said if you swap coastlines, like if you swapped them around, they actually have the better coastline. Because um, it's, it's got more nooks and crannies and more like jagged. And there's more things for like, you know, to, to, for ways to cur- curve around. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, but Miami, um, I didn't get it that good. That I've, I know the image you're talking of. I've seen it. It's only, it, it's, it's so rare that it actually gets like that. Yeah. And it's, and the reason I brought up the golf is it's the same thing. It lasts like, it's almost like someone turns the valve off. They're like, okay, that's it. It's over. Like literally like they'll, they'll be like one set come through and then that is it. Like it's over. Like you could sit out there for another three hours and nothing comes. Like you almost oh, wow. have to paddle okay. in. Like, and then uh, and, and it gets really crowded. And there's really, weirdly enough, there's like locals in Miami. Yeah. Um, and I get it. They get really territorial during that swell because, like I said, like you got about, you got about a five hour window and then it's over. So they're like, you know, when people show up and there's, this is our turf, you know, like we only have this much time, like we're going to hold the, hold the fort and try to take as much as we can. So yeah. but there's a couple of good spots down there. I mean, there's like Pump House. You've got Reef Road. Yeah. The natural, which is not a natural reef, but they buried a bunch of trash. You know, so <laughs> classic yeah. Florida. What do we do with all this trash? Let's just throw it in the ocean. Um, yeah. <laughs> so when you're when you're growing up in Florida, when did you? What was your surfing like? When did you start surfing? How did that come about in your life? Uh, I started really young um, because, as you guys know from being there, like there's not much else to do it's a barrier island you're surrounded by water there's water in the ocean and there's a the river which is about like i want to say like three or four miles on the other side um and my parents my dad surfed in the 60s he actually surfed with murph the surf um murph i think the surf. there's a rumor that he just passed away recently but no one really knows which is pretty much like murph the surf. he's that famous he stole the baseball diamond in miami and like there's a movie about him and uh <laughs> yeah yeah he's pretty like he's like a legend he was like he like brought surfing to florida um and then no he was, way. yeah, was, he, and then was also one of the biggest jewel thieves in the history of the world. So, um, <laughs> is really pretty typical. Um, but, um, uh, so my dad's he's like a living then, point break in real life. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's been, there's been sort of a, you know, it's never been confirmed, but there, there's, you know, point break they say was loosely based because, I mean, the, the Murtha Surf story is pretty famous. So I think when they were writing point break, they sort of, you know, hey, you know, and, and if you know enough surfers, especially like life pump surfers that are like completely mm-hmm. obsessed with it, like a lot of them are kind of like, they're like, I always say they're like pirates. They're almost like, they're, they do things like that, like break the law, necessarily like things that'll hurt people, but they'll like, yeah, like steal a diamond or something. <laughs> like <laughs> always have some scam to surf, like to pay for their surfing habit. They'll like, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
so yeah, I grew up, um, and my dad surfed, and my dad, like, went, always was in fishing, or was always in the ocean doing something, so as a kid, you know, you do, you, your parents bring you along, uh, so we would go to the Keys every summer, and I'm, like, I was three years old, and my, my parents would tie a life, tie my life jacket to the boat, and just throw me over, and I would, I would just, like, uh, snorkel for, like, like, five, about six hours a day, just face in the water, like, looking at the reefs, and the sharks, and the fish and my dad would die for lobsters and then uh and then I started water skiing when I was like I think I was only like four my dad actually tied my water skis together because I wasn't strong enough to like yeah. keep them from going apart so he put like a rope to keep them from going like this so yeah. and then as I got older I just you know I was in the ocean so much and I just progressed to like surfing um and then I stopped for a while and then I ended up getting my parents put me in a private school and uh the, uh, there was a surfer his name was Danny Mahato and he was a year older than me and he surfed for Billabong. And I didn't even know that was a thing that you could surf for a company and get free clothes. And he just was so cool. He's like the coolest guy in the world. And he had this like just white hair and like, he was like so tan cause he surfed every day after school. And I got excited. And then he like, he brought a magazine to school and he was in the magazine. And I was like, Oh my God, this guy's like a, you know, he's super famous. <laughs> um, so I just thought it was super cool. And then I, I got, he kind of got me back into it. And then I just, again, like you said, like, like, like I said, like, you guys know, like, there's not much there. So, uh, you know, it just becomes, it's this weird culture of that place, where it almost is just, it's your life, and you live every day. And I think, you know, we talked about this before, where, you know, if you almost feel bad, if you don't go surfing, you like, if your friends go in the morning, and it's good, and they tell you it's good, and you didn't go for whatever reason, even if you had to work, they kind of they kind of put it to you like you know you missed it why didn't you go like you know you, you blew it like it was great and so you have feel this like weird pressure to like to surf even if you don't uh, even want to you have this like it's like a I don't know it's a weird it's almost like how football is to some parts of the country you know that's how surfing is to that that little strip of land especially with the the history of those who have come from there you know it's mm -hmm. it's that lost coast but it's really there's there's a significant presence of professional surfers who have come out of like kind of i don't know what sebastian inlet to jacksonville yeah Just that that like a1a drag it's it's got a beautiful time and a beautiful amount of people that come from it and and so then you you started surfing but the other side of your life is film so when and how did that come about the love for photography and videography well, I can tie that into what you just said about the, the, the surfers. Yeah. So you, and, you know, we touched on this before, you know, you're growing up and then your friends are becoming like the greatest surfers, not in your area, but in the entire world. And they're on this stage. And again, it pushes you. I mean, I never even got anywhere close to that, but um, your friends are, and, and, you know, and, you're, and you, you're learning about this. You're learning about other spots in the world. You're learning how professional surfing works. And it is, uh, we obviously we cover a little bit as they are from there. The names of the top professional surfers that came from there, you know, documentary in itself is why that area produces that because, you know, it's not, there isn't, the waves aren't good. Like, in, and you can go three or four months without, you know, barely even a single wave in the ocean. So, why do this, why does this very small, weird strip of land? in the middle of Florida produce it, which th there's obviously many, many different factors, I think, but there is no right or wrong answer at this point. No one knows. Um, so, you know, I'm growing up and I'm surfing. I'm not, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm not that good, but my friends are better. My friends are the, some of the best surfers in the world and people around me. And there's a surf photographer named Tom Dugan who lives down the street from me, um, who I meet and he runs a surf magazine. And so I'm like, you know, 13 and my parents, take a trip to Japan. My dad worked for a company called Harris and he had to go over there for business. And he, they bought this video camera. It was called a high Sony Hi eight. And at the time those cameras, you know, no, everyone just had like the big VHSs and they were clumsy and they didn't take good video quality and they didn't, you couldn't zoom very far. So my parents go there and they also bought a, uh, like a, a zoom, like extender for my camera, which um, they, they knew, I don't know. It's it's interesting that I'm talking about this because I don't know if they knew I wanted to shoot surfing. I don't know why they bought the, the extra lens where I could get, you know, zoom farther out, but I'll have to ask them. That's interesting. Was it the, <laughs> yeah. So they came back with that. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, so I was like, I, they showed it to me and I was like, oh, this is insane. So I would take it and, and I would surf and then I would video my, 
I would video surfers and like my mom would video me. And then, so I just, so then I got a tripod and I just like, um, so then the photographer, Tom Dugan, so he would go to Sebastian Inlet, which uh, at the time it's, it was a, you know, it's not like it was back in, then because of some structural changes, but that place was amazing as far as like, there was always a wave there. And it was like this like proving ground where like all those guys we mentioned that grew up to be world-class surfers from there would go. And it, and it, and that's one of the reasons I think a lot of them got so good. It was like, imagine being around the best people and you're constantly like pushing each other. And it's this like, almost like a wave pool type wave where the wave is the exact wave almost every time. So, you know, one guy would do something, the other guy would see it and then go, okay, I know what I can do now. I'm going to try this. And then they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing each other. I remember paddling out as a kid and it was like, it had this feeling of um, you. I was, you were nervous because you had to perform. If you didn't perform, because everyone was there, everyone was watching you. There's cameras on the beach. Even if you're not a top pro, you'd had this like pressure. Um, so I started going with them down there. Like, so, you know, he would take me with like Matt Keckley and, and Todd Morcom and oh, Kelly cool. Slater. We would all go down there and we would shoot. And then we'd go back to Tom's house. And, you know, I, again, I could plug the camera right in and we would all watch it and order pizza. Um, and also, so he was a photographer, so he was taking photos and that was film. There was no digital. So no one could see the photos he took instantly. So, you know, it'd be like a week or two by the time he got, it, they shoot slides is what they would shoot. So he would go to get him to develop. So everyone thought that was like, all the surfers were like, this is amazing. We can go watch ourselves. So, and then it just progressed from there where, you know, I'm not going to be the pro. I'm very aware of that. Um, but I love the sport and it's all I know. And I have this camera and I enjoy this. So that's, it just all kind of sprung from there. That's, and, and so now you're, you're shooting video and you're traveling back and forth. And I, I heard what you said about Sebastian. I still think there's that cultural element to that beach. You mm -hmm. go there and it, it still has that kind of sense of, I don't know, it, it's like an urgent, you have to do something. You, you, you can't just be out there on a, Soft, well, I guess now soft tops are kind of a big thing, but um, you know, you couldn't be out there on a wave storm just having fun. It really does have that kind of culture to it. And, and kids always told me that when I was growing up. Um, but so you're shooting photography and mm -hmm. you had one of your videos picked up and was put into Kelly in black and white, which is an iconic surf movie from like growing up. I remember it. And, mm -hmm. and what did that feel like? You know, you're, you're growing up with all these people with Kelly and the Hobgoods and everyone else who's in this town as your friend, you're shooting them. And then your footage as a kid gets put into that video. What's that like? Yeah. It, it, I, you know, being a kid and having that happen again, it just feels like that's just what happens. I imagine it's the same feeling of like, say you grow up. I mean, not the same exact feeling, but a similar feeling to like, if Michael Jordan is your father, you just sort of like, it's all you know, right? Or like the kids, I always, I have a fascination with kids who grew up in the White House, whose parents, is the, whose dad is the president. Like that's got to be a, such a bizarre existence, but it's all you know. So it doesn't feel, you know, as a kid, like you just, you just go with what's around you. You don't know any different, right? Um, you know, like sometimes when I've traveled to third world countries and I see kids that like don't have hardly anything and sometimes they're the happiest. And I'm, I'm, at first I feel like, oh, I feel bad for this kid. Like, it's awful. Like, he lives in like a hut, you know? And then you mm -hmm. sometimes get to know the kid. And the kid is literally the happiest kid in the world. You're like, I mean, because I, I would go to Costa Rica every summer as a kid. And we made friends. You know, we'd be like 12, 13 years old. And we would make friends with some of the 12, 13-year-old kids there. And you go to the, and, you know, go to their house. And you'd be like, oh, my God, this is their house? This is like a shack. But the kid is, the, in his family, they're so happy. You know, I mean, they're Costa Rica is not a third world country for, by any means, but like, you know, they don't have the things I had. And I would mm -hmm. think like, oh, this is terrible. But then they're so happy. So because that's all they know. And, and that's all they, they need in life. So back to your point, I, I when it, my footage end, ended up in Kelly Slater Black and White, I was just sort of like, oh, that's cool. You know, and I, I didn't get they didn't credit me. And I didn't even care because I remember people saying, like, you know, you're not even credited. You get credits. Like, I, was, I didn't care. I was 14 at the time. I was like, oh, that's so cool, you know? Um, and then, you know, I, I think I mentioned this where uh, Kelly um, called me um, and said, hey, you know, sorry, we didn't uh, get you, you know, your name in the credits or, you know, you didn't get any money. And I, at 14 years old, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about money. So um, I was like, oh, 
you know, I, I, I actually had thought, I had, a, I had a friend who lived down the street from me who can do impersonations. And he would sometimes call me and, and impersonate Kelly's voice or like, you know, <laughs> and so I thought it was my friend totally messing with me. So I was being like such a smart ass back. I can't remember what I was saying because I, I think I blocked that from my mind how horrifying it is thinking about what I was saying. <laughs> such kind of a dick to him. And he was really like, he was kind of, I remember him being like, oh, okay, like, like what? He couldn't understand why. Because <laughs> here he is like, because he was offering me a box of clothes from Quicksilver. He's like, you know, I'll talk to Quicksilver. I'm going to get, give me your sizes. I'm going to write them down and, I'll, and give me your address and I'll have a box of clothes shipped to you for doing that. You know, thanks so much. I'm sorry that, you know, it didn't, you didn't get it. Because Kelly gave him, I had given Kelly the footage on like a VHS and he had mm -hmm. given it to them and they didn't, you know, they didn't even ask who shot it, whatever, you know, typical, yeah. again, typical surf video, like, they, like we'll just put it out and figure <laughs> out what happens later. Um, so, um, so yeah, so he, uh, so once I realized it was Kelly, I was, I was like really mortified um, that I was acting like that, but I totally corrected myself, obviously. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, I, I got a box of clothes, like, a, and I was like ecstatic that I got a box of clothes. So, um, you know, it, again, it didn't feel like, it wasn't like this like aha moment of like the light shining in and going, this is your big break. It was just sort of like, cool, because I'd grown up around these people and it just felt like, oh, that's what happens, you know? I think the interesting thing too, looking back on it from an outsider's perspective too, is it seems that you were in such a good place at a great time in the history of surfing too, with, with it sort of getting more mainstream and those brands starting to become something videos getting published on a huge larger level people having more access to it and it's just becoming more mainstream it it's cool it's from an outsider's yeah. perspective i'm pretty jealous i'm like oh okay. man that that's that's just like the right place at the right time yeah you know around those people yeah which looking back and on everything in life if you look back at every good thing in your life you can almost say you were in the right place at the right time yeah yeah and definitely. it is it, it's hard for, yeah go ahead i'm sorry oh. for you oh. yeah i was gonna say um it uh it just feels you know you don't realize it in the moment a lot of times uh that you're in that moment until you look back and i do that definitely now especially with kelly becoming kelly you know the greatest surfer of all time like and it's actually not even really arguable that he's not the greatest surfer of all time at this point <laughs> unless someone comes around and beats him which I don't know who's beating 11 world titles. Like that's just beyond, you know, yeah. and, it's, I, and I try to explain to people that don't surf. I'm like, he's arguably the greatest athlete of all time to win 11 world titles in the sport of surfing where, you know, your court isn't the same all the time. You can't predict the wave, you know, like you can only, you know, you're dealing with so much out of your control and to win 11 is insane. But, you know, I look back and think like, I remember I got to surf with him a lot, you know, as a child. And it was so like, you know, and it was always, he was always that he, like, I think we talked about this where certain celebrities have a certain like presence. And he always had, like, even if you didn't know who he was, you, he had this sort of, he has a sort of presence. And uh, yeah. so you'd see him surfing and he always was, you always watched him because he was head and tails above everybody else. Just even if he fell or didn't have a good wave, there was just, he just had this thing. So I definitely look back and, and I'm appreciative that, yeah, I mean, just by happen happenstance i got to watch the greatest surfer of all time surf in person quite often as a child you know and watch him <laughs> learn um and grow you know so yeah. arguably i would say he is one of one of the greatest athletes ever i mean yeah even even like you said there even if you predict you're on the same court every mm -hmm. time and you play the same team mm -hmm. there wouldn't be someone who had 11 world titles yeah you know even the yeah. same team there and I, I think the only other person who would be at the same caliber or factor, maybe a little bit ahead would be Tiger Woods. Yeah. But, but at the same time, you predict, you, you, you go to that course and you play that course four times in a row. Yeah, yeah. The minor things change. Yeah. The wind and variables and things like that. But that, that's the only one I would say. Yeah. He definitely is head, heads over. Yeah. He was the, the best. Yeah. And I'm thinking about how his, it seems like his work ethic and his drive reflects a lot of the mentality that we've talked about with that little strange island, that little strange triple in. And growing up, it seems like you guys are really competitive with each other, pushing each other to be out there surfing. If if you're not out there surfing, you should feel mm -hmm. guilty that you're not doing it. And opening up the idea of self-analysis through going back and watching the videos, like who was doing that at the time? Who was, who was actually putting those things together? 
Yeah. It, it's well, yeah, cool. that's, yeah, that's, that's the part. Yeah. Where, so, yeah. So eventually it led to me, uh, where Kelly sometimes would pick me up from like school afterwards and then take me to the inlet and we would go shoot or we would go shoot somewhere. And then he, he would come back to my house. And I, I mentioned this where he would watch himself like frame by frame by frame. And he would just sit there with my camera and just like pause, unpause, back up. And at first I was like, this guy's crazy. Like, this is a little <laughs> excessive. Um, what is he doing? And then as I realized, as we shot some more and he did it, he was just watching, he was and now doing self analysis for like how to throw his weight and how he could shift his body and how he could like, you know, because he has, you know, at the time, I mean, everyone can do it now. And I think we're athletes have really like I, in the future, it's going to be incredible because the way, you know, obviously you can record yourself nonstop now and the way you can self analyze, but back then it wasn't quite as uh, accessible. So, you know, I, I watched him pull his first like reverse and he just kept trying, kept trying, kept trying. And then not only kept trying, but kept watching. He'd go back and watch himself and watch how his weight shifted and how his body shifted when he did it. And then finally after, you know, a few days or maybe a week or so, I can't remember, he finally uh, pulled that off. So yeah, that was, uh, that was interesting to see as well. But again, as a child, you just, again, it doesn't really register, you know, that's the same thing with like, I wonder about kids who grew up in the White House. Like, I think it probably doesn't even really register until later in life that, oh, I guess not everyone grows up in the White House. A lot of them, too. A lot of, those, <laughs> a lot of those kids, they probably grew up with their parents being like a senator or someone yeah. in Congress. So it's just like, oh, yeah, we just moved across the street, just up the road. I'm like, no, what? I, I can't even imagine. That is something I've never thought about, but it's got to be crazy. Um, yeah. So, so you find yourself falling in love with film, and then you head to Full Sail which is a arts college in the Orlando area. Why, why did you choose Full Sail as your fir first stop? Um, my parents were forcing me to go to college. I originally had gone to uh, Brevard Community College, which is just like mm -hmm. a, you know, whatever, community college. So, um, and I, there was nothing there for me. Like I was just, wasn't interested. I wanted to surf. Um, so my parents took me, they, my, my, you know, back to government, my uncle was, a, uh, he was, a, 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 in the, in the house, in the Florida house. So he mm -hmm. knew a full sale because they had a lobbyist. And so he sent some information to my mom and said, Hey, there's this, you know, school in, in Orlando that you should check out. It's only two years and, um, it's really expensive, but my, um, you know, he can learn more about video and film. And that seems to be what he's interested in. So my mom showed me, I remember, I'll never forget, it was like this pamphlet, because you know, now everything's online, but it's like literally this little like leaflet thing. And the photos, I was like, oh my God, this place looks like a spaceship. And then when you toured it, you were, if you were interested in any sort of like audio or video, you were pretty much sold just on the tour because the place does, it looks, it, I mean, I hadn't been there obviously in many years, but even back then it was like, this place looks like, it looks like the future. So I want to- It still does. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I can't. Last time I drove by, I you hit it on the head. It looked exactly like a spaceship. <laughs> yeah, and and what you know, kid that's interested in technology doesn't want to go to school on a side of spaceship, you know, like yeah. so. Um, so I was hooked and sold, and and I and I it is what I loved. I did love it. Like I would like edit, you know, I used to edit vid videos of the inlet. Like we would go down there, and then I would the next couple of days I would like literally like unpause my VCR and then play the camera and then pause my VCR and like do it like that, and then I would somehow figure out how to like put a song on I'd use like Guns N' Roses or something and then you know and then we would I would show I would go, we would go, go down to Tom Dugan's house when everyone was down there and we would all watch it together it was like I was making like the first like surf videos of that nature um obviously surf movies existed before me big time but like as far as like you know put to punk rock or whatever you know like of just surfing clips um you know that was uh so so I went to Full Sail and I you know I graduated I interned um, on a show called MTV Sandblast, which was um, like their version of Glad American Gladiators. And uh, I had one of the hosts, I randomly knew the host, it was Peter King, who is also is a very well-known surfer, but he had somehow gotten on as a host of the show. And he went on to be like a, a DJ on MTV for several years after. Um, he's such a boisterous, like funny, he's a, he is a personality. He literally is just a person. He's, I mean, not just personality, but definitely a personality. Like he's so funny and just like a character in real life. So mm -hmm. um, I, I ended up interning and, uh, and I had met him the summer before because I, I was making a surf video at the time. 
and I'd been out in California and my friend had introduced me to him. We went to his house and he had actually done the intro for the surf video where I knocked on his door and I, I was like, Hey, I'm making a surf video. Will you help me? And he, and, and the skit was, he like chases me off his porch and says, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? And like, and like, and like, get out of here. And he like chases me down his front porch. And I put that as, as a video called horseplay. And I put it on the very opening of the video. So when I got there and I saw he was the host and he was like, he recognized me. And so, um, I actually spent most of the time in his trailer playing video games. And when they would call me on the, the walkie talkie, they'd be like, you know, Justin, you need to come take the trash or whatever. He would always, if we were like in a game, he'd be like, don't go. He's like, what are they gonna do? Fire you? <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd be invited on set by him to play video games. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and then, and then the other one was, uh, I got to work in the camera department on a, a Steven Spielberg was shooting a uh, sequest, which was like this futuristic, like, spaceship but underwater show it was really bad but um uh but it was it was a time it was also again right place right time orlando was it they had just opened up the sound stage at universal studios and there was all these mm. tax breaks and incentives so and they you know hollywood they'll always try something once so they were like let's go shoot in orlando you know let's mm -hmm. let's move these shows there so it was a ton of shows and, and movies happening at the time it didn't last because eventually everything just comes back to los angeles that seems to be the key the the, uh, the common thread but so I was an intern and you know and, and I got to be in the camera department and of course they're shooting 35 millimeter film and I'm getting to learn about like lenses and like different lenses and like different you know film stocks and really um, you know the cinematography aspect of a show which I you know I, I learned some in full sale but to actually see it in real life with you know actors and stars and, and a whole crew um, that was really fascinating interesting to me as well and learn like okay this is a very important the cinematography obviously is a very important aspect to any project and the people that do it there's a certain level of talent there um you know how they light what film stock they use the lenses all that so and they taught you that kind of as a fundamental learning in at at school right but now yeah. you're seeing the practice of it and it really becomes a, an artist and style right you're you're there's a there's a educational side of it but there really is an artistic side of choosing the film stock to match what the director is looking for in the view and style i, I have no idea what i'm talking about but i'm just kind of spitballing well, in you, that you, concept you sound like you do um <laughs> i've been you, listening you, to you this is the second time you know because you're right um and i'm so and then you know, as i continued on in my career i'm almost like a like i have i have a, a this is a photography that I keep and I just anytime I see something I like I write their name down and I even have ones that have um, passed away that I always wanted to work with I'm like I'm not I'm not taking them off the list um, just because I'm you know I'm like I'm just gonna keep them on this list because um, I so there is even if you shoot on an iPhone if you shoot on anything nowadays there's just people that are just better at it and uh, they just have this like like an, like you said like an artistic gift of lighting and Compo com you know, composition and framing and just things that, um, you know, if you're looking for someone for a certain look or a certain project, there's, you know, there's people that do black and white that can literally do black and white better than anyone else that can do black and white. Um, it was more so um, significant when people shot film, but to this day, there still is um, certain cinematographers and directors of photography that that they just, they're just so much better at what they do. Um, I'm not, I, I'm a, I, I know what I like in a, in, a, in a cinematographer and what I'm looking for, but I'm not a, a cinematographer. But, um, I, and I, I, that's also what I learned on Sequest. I'm like, I like this and I wanna learn about it, but this isn't my, this isn't my, this isn't where I need to be. And so you're on Sequest working on that show um, and then you decide to drive across the country and move to LA, right? Yeah. Why? I mean, obviously I, I can speculate why, but I would love to hear your reasoning behind it. Yeah. Um, and actually I, I just thought of this like random story that I completely forgot about on Sequest, but it's kind of funny. And I think you and your audience uh, might enjoy it. Uh, so Mark Hamill was on, you know, obviously Luke Scott. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was on a couple of shows and for whatever reason that one day they handed me, so you get, you get the scripts, right? Like the little, like, you know, and everyone, I don't know why I had it. Honestly, I can't remember why. 
because I was in the camera department. I guess maybe I was, oh, I know why, because I think I was, they were letting me do the, the slate. I was like filling in for the second. So I get to like clap the slate, which is again, like it's almost like, it almost is like Sebastian Inlet pressure. Cause you're like, if I mess <laughs> up, like you know, all these people are like, you know, and I'm just, so I remember, so I was sitting there following along in the script and Mark Hamill was acting. I was obviously behind the camera, I was, but I was off to the side and he for time and <laughs> And for whatever reason, I have no idea why, he looked at me and I literally till this moment, I've completely forgot about this moment till now. He looked at me and went like this to tell me, tell him his line. And my instinct, and I shouldn't have done this, but I guess it was okay. I said, um, I'm your father. <laughs> um, and, and everyone laughed for him. And I, but then he finally laughed, but like, I just, I blurted out. I don't even know what made me do it. Like it just blurted out of my mouth. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, it couldn't I, have been a better line to blurt out though. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but I, I don't know why I, I told, and I totally forgot that story for now. Um, but anyways, the reason <laughs> I moved to Los Angeles was, is I started making those videos <laughs> at such a young age. Um, and it, um, oh my gosh. Yeah, I, admit, I started making such a young age that I burnt out because I had gone to film school. I'd learned like, you know, I'd been on real sets. I'd learned like, okay, this is how this works. Surfing and it, especially at the time of the Taylor Steele momentum generation era, era, which I was in, surf videos were just, it didn't matter what you shot them on. It didn't matter where the light, it didn't matter, none of that mattered. All that mattered was the guys doing the trick. So it was like, honestly, it's like shooting seagulls. Like you're just like following <laughs> them. You couldn't, you know, there was no creativity. Um, so I had CJ and Damien, Hobgood and I, they had just, graduated high school and they had just turned professional and they were doing the world tour and we decided to make a movie together sort of their coming out movie and um it was them and they handpicked a couple other guys to be in it and i so it was my movie i shot it um with them but again it's a surf video so it's just surfing um and i cj and i had taken a trip to new york and just to go because he had curiosities like me of seeing places that didn't had nothing to do with surfing so we went and i videoed him while i was there because i had this little camera and I ended up putting a little clip in the movie and calling it NYCJ. And it was literally him talking, it was voiceover of him saying, I don't get to travel much outside of surfing. And it's really cool to go to places that are, I don't surf, blah, blah, blah. And everyone told me like, you need to take that out of the movie. You can't put that in the movie. It was literally like, I think it was 20 seconds. Um, and I'm like, no, I'm keeping it in. I don't care. I don't care what anyone says. I'm keeping this in. Like I'm breaking up the monotony of just nonstop surfing. Um, and that was part of what led me to like, I want to do more. Like, I don't want to just keep making surf movies. And I'd taken a trip to Barbados with like Pat O'Connell and a couple other pros for a surfing, surfing magazine and hired me to go shoot surfing there. And uh, it ended up not a really good time. And like, just was like, why am I doing this? I'm just so sick of, honestly, like it's fun. Cause everyone's like, oh, you know, at the time and, and even to the day, people are like, oh, it's so cool. You get to go travel all these places and shoot surfing. I'm like, yeah, but you don't get to surf. Like when it's good, mm -hmm. you're on the beach. Yeah. And like, it, it can be blistering hot. It could be, pouring rain and you don't you're having to hide under a tent or a towel or like it's not that fun to be honest um so and i just i just was sick of surfing i didn't even like it anymore so i was trying to figure out what to do and i was sitting in my living room and i was watching mtv and, and britney spears baby one more time came on camera i mean i'm sorry on the screen and i i remember spitting my cereal out and just going i don't know what this is I mean, I know what it is, the music video, but I have no nothing about, I didn't, I, I'm like, is this, this must be an industry. Like it never occurred to me before that this is obviously something, does MTV make these? Who makes these and, and, and why? And, and how do they make them? And how does it all work? Um, but I'm like, this is mm -hmm. cool because there's obviously a lot of creativity here because a music video can be anything, right? Like, I mean, obviously there's a certain yeah. style to it, but like, you know, there's a story, there's not a story, there's performance and like there's lighting. It's, there's a lot of, a lot of cinematography goes in the music video, especially when there's a female artist, a beauty aspect to it. So I was just in my brain, I'm like, that's what I want to do. So I'm, I'll never forget that moment. I literally decided I'm going to sell everything I own and I'm going to pack my stuff and I'm going to move to, uh, to Los Angeles. And I, and I'd never been to Los Angeles. I'd only been to Orange County and uh, like Newport and Huntington. So, but I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm, you know, I'm going to give it a try at least and, and see where the, you know, see what happens. Maybe I fail. Maybe I don't like it, but, can always move home. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. what was your what was your first move when you landed out there on the West Coast, and how'd you finally get your foot in the door with with that industry? Um, so I lived with um, some friends in uh, Newport Beach that I'd known. That I come I used to come out every summer for the U.S. Open, and like 
obviously all the surf companies are in Costa Mesa. So, um, so I knew people there. So I just, I, w- I literally couch surfed. And then um, this, these two girls that were the sweetest girls in the world and their family was so sweet. They were like, you can stay with us. So I, I moved in with them and, um, and I would drive to LA every day. And I like, you know, I would, and the internet, I would pull up, um, I would pull up the production companies that did music videos because I was, you know, researching and mm-hmm. I would, uh, I, I would drive there and just drop off my resume and literally just, you know, Hey, I'll, I'll do it. My, my resume was like my internships, my school and like surf movies, which don't translate to Los, to music videos or Los Angeles. No one cares, you know, surf videos are just nothing. So <laughs> any success I had there was just a whitewash. It was, it didn't matter. So, but I didn't care. I was like, I don't care if I have to start over. I don't care if I have to intern. I don't care. I have to, you know, whatever. I'm just, I, I want to learn about this. And, and, and it seems like a really great, interesting, um, creative industry. So I would just drive and drop off resumes. And, um, you know, one day I met this woman who uh, ran an association called the MVPA, which was the Music Video Production Association. And they sort of like dealt with all the production companies and they had an award show. And I um, met with her. So I forget, I think I just emailed her cold and, and she said, you can come in and meet, maybe like intern with us. So um, I saw she was wearing like a Hurley shirt. So I was like, oh, do you like Hurley? And she said, yeah. And I, she got my, I get, I'm like, give me your sizes, I'll get you clothes. And she was probably like, what, this is weird. Um, but I was like, oh, I know, I know, Bob, I know Bob Hurley. And she was, again, probably thought I was lying or what that even means. So anyways, I did know Bob Hurley. So I went and got, I, I asked Bob if I could come get some clothes for her. And he was like, Bob has always been, Bob used to help pay for some of my trips for, I don't even know why with Billabong. And like, he has always been super supportive. And like, he always would talk to me about my videos. Like, I love this. I don't like this. I think you should do more of this. Always been super supportive and kind. That's cool. Um, so he was like you can go um he's like, he's like yeah come grab some clothes so i went to the warehouse and grabbed a bunch of clothes for her and then gave them to her and from then on out she was like well i think i can help you get into this company i'll introduce you to this person and i ended up um i i remember i pa'd one uh master p video and then uh which awesome was called, that's so cool <laughs> yeah it was, a hor- it was a horrible experience and then, uh, <laughs> and then um and then i i was actually I was too old. i was like too old to be a pa i'm like this is stupid like um, but whatever. And then I ended up being an assistant at a company to an executive producer. I was an intern. And then I ended up being her assistant and getting to work with directors, um, Diane Martel and Evan Bernard. And Diane at the time was doing all the NER, NERD videos. And she ended up doing like Justin Timberlake's first video. And so I got to be on like all those sets. And I got to like watch the process from the entire process. And since I wasn't technically working on set, I would just get to go like, you know, I would finish work at like six, seven o'clock in the office. And then you know, the shoots go all night or whatever. So I would get to go, I would go down to the stage or wherever the location was and just be a fly on the wall on all those shoots and just listen and learn. And then that led to, you know, me leaving that company and going to Band Apart, which was Lawrence Spender and Quentin Tarantino's company, but they had a music video commercial division. So I worked there, same thing. Um, and as I'm going, the music video industry is like slowly dying as, um, cause budgets are being cut, labels are, you know, CDs are dying and like, you know, not, Napster is popping up and artists are losing money. And so that, of course, music video at the time was marketing. So that's being cut. So, but it was still a business. Um, and then I ended up at a company called Anonymous Content, uh, which Steve Golan owned, who produced Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mine and being John Malkovich. And they had directors like David Fincher and Mark Romanek and like literally like the greatest, I mean, Mark Romanek arguably is the greatest music video director of all time. He did like Johnny Cash Hurt and Jay-Z 99 Problems. Uh, um, so he, um, so I got to go there and, and work with directors. And at this point I had like graduated into, um, writing the treatments, which is, so every music video, how it works is they send the record label sends a budget and a basic idea and says, you know, here's the shoot dates. Is your director available? Can they, um, if they are and they're interested, can they listen to the song and write a treatment, which basically write their idea for what they think the video should be within these parameters of like, it has to shoot in New York. It has to shoot in LA, it has to shoot these dates, it has to be this budget. So um, directors are so busy and they don't necessarily have time to sit and write all the treatments. So they had people work with them. So I ended up working with some directors, um, namely Jake Nava, who had done a bunch of Beyonce videos. He, done, he did Crazy in Love. He was this, a British guy from uh, the UK who had moved over and had some success like doing these really beautiful like pop videos, but doing them with like a darker, really cool look. Um, so I worked with him. I actually got to work with Joaquin Phoenix. Um, he cool. came to our company and, and had a friend who had a music video and uh, he wanted to direct it. So he had, 
he knew Steve. And so he reached out to Steve and Steve put him in touch with us. And I ended up um, writing, he ended up doing like three or four videos and I would work with him. I'd go to his house and we would write treatments because and his, <laughs> his ideas are always so amazing and just totally insane. Like, cause he didn't like, <laughs> he had no, like, it wasn't his, he didn't, he wasn't making a living off it. So he literally was just like, I want to do this. And he would have these crazy ideas. And like, I'd help him like get it into an idea to where we could actually sit, submit it or whatever. And uh, so that was, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's how I um, ended up in music videos. That's cool. Can I'm I, wondering can now. I, you, can I pause one second? Mentioned... I wanna, um, oh yeah. My, uh, my light is dying and I want to switch it out real quick. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Do you hear, can you hear this going on upstairs? I don't hear anything on your side, no. Okay, good. I'm getting all the sirens and church bells. Oh, Luna or or Cat is running around with Luca, I think. I think he's in his he's got this little like cart. He's like running around in it. That's awesome. Okay. Sorry about that. Cool. No worries. Yeah, dude. no worries. Yeah, I wanted to ask about some particular music videos that you might remember as being standouts to you and influencing you or or just ones that stand out like the Britney Spears uh, hit me baby one more time like for me I remember so vividly growing up and just I remember watching um, Weapon of Choice with Christopher Walk and dancing mm -hmm. around through that hotel and just being like what is this this is so strange and just bizarre to me but it stood out so much and and that is like the iconic music video in, in my mind from my childhood, my adolescence growing up. What sort of memorable music videos really influenced you or stand out to you in your memory? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, it's kind of obviously changed, but it, at the time, like let's say like late, mid nineties through like, you know, 2007, 2000, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. It's a, it was a really beautifully creative genre like yeah like that like the weapon of choice like spike jones like that's just i mean i'm a huge spike jones fan like i got to be on a set with him one time for this beck video and um oh, cool. it wasn't even his he was actually just um doing a favor to one, our british directors um uh hammer and tongs that they ended up they did a galaxy uh hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy he was mm -hmm. friends with them and they we were doing this beck video and they couldn't fly over for, for the uk so spike just like 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 ghost directed for them because it, it was like all green screen <laughs> so it, and uh so anyways but yeah no i mean it was a, it's a beautiful genre in the sense that like the creativity of like it's these got these some of those top directors like spike and michelle gondry and of course like david fincher and mark romantic those guys are like they're artists and like the way they like you know because that's that was spike's idea like he literally said like and i i if you watch there's a so there's a series of directors DVDs that came out obviously like a long time ago with their DVDs, but they did one on Spike and they have Christopher Walken talking about that video. And if I remember right, like he basically just like called him and said like, I have this idea, <laughs> you, know, you you're a good dancer and I want you to just dance. And I remember Christopher Walken was like, like, was like, what, is, what are you talking about? Like, you know, and obviously that's, that's that video, that video is so iconic, but um, you know, I, as a child, like thriller, like I think I was like, oh I was, yeah. I was a little kid, but and I, my parents wouldn't even let me watch it for a long time. But I remember them finally, I was finally at someone's house. I don't even remember who, and my mom was there. And they, these two girls that were older than me were like in the bedroom watching it over and over and over again with the lights out on a VHS tape. And my mom let me go watch it. And I was just like, oh. I'm like, this is amazing. So I think it was always in me. And then, you know, obviously like, it's funny because I have so many videos in my head, but um, you know, obviously the Prodigy Smack My Bitch Up video um johnny to me I remember, people ask me like what's your favorite i'm like a music video connoisseur of like or maybe stopped in like 2012 but like um <laughs> uh, johnny cash hurt is people ask me what i think the best video is and obviously it's this is all it's all subjective because yeah you know but to me johnny cash hurt if you watch that video like it because of the emotion that it captures um is just is the best video of all time like it's just the emotion of it is incredible um so that, you know, I, I loved, uh, trying to think of some other music videos that I loved. Um, I did like Jay-Z, I, I did really like Jay-Z 99 Problems. Um, and then I'm trying to think of any other, it's funny cause I like, I have so many, but I almost can't think of like specific yeah. videos um, that, you know, there was some, um, man, what is some, 
I, I can't believe I'm like spacing maybe because I've like left the genre in my brain um yeah I'm trying to think definitely those videos and maybe anything anything oh Mich anything by Michelle Gondry or or Spike um Spike Jones, anything by like Chris Cunningham. I, it's funny because I, I like know more like directors than I can yeah. actually think of think of their specific work. Um, Francis Lawrence, who I, I wasn't necessarily a fan of like a lot of pop videos, but Francis Lawrence, who um, went on to do that. He's done a bunch of movies now. He did that the movie I Am Legend. Uh, oh yeah, so, right oh yeah. So he he did that. So he did uh, Cry Me a River, which I thought was a beautiful mm -hmm. pop video. I just thought that was really uh, well done. So, you know, I, it's funny because what I used to do when I worked at these production companies, we had a TV and we had MTV on all day long. And it was part of my job to watch MTV, which isn't a bad part of your job. So, but we would like literally break down videos to like, the, you know, it's like anything. Like if it's a, if it's the job you're in, you know, you break it down. Like even like a professional athlete can, or, you know, people in professional sports break down, you know, like the announcers of an NBA game, like they break down the minutest little moments. So we would sit down and we, I could break down a video and I still can, like I can watch any video now and go, okay, this is what I think is good. This is what I think is bad. This is what I think, you know, um, this is where they, this is what they're trying to say. This is what they're trying to achieve. This, did they achieve it? I don't know. Like you can literally like measure um, into a video and then also know, I mean, because I ended up directing them as well. Like, you know, like, oh, this isn't what they wanted. Like they probably didn't run out of time or didn't they didn't get the location they wanted or or sometimes like wow they they got so lucky and knocked it out of the park like you know things came together and and they pulled this off you know um yeah so audio slave cochise which is the one with the fireworks oh i love that song so yeah. much yeah which again is mark romantic and that's he he directed that as well and like i mean that again it's so simple but so just perfect for the song and just genius of like these just they're just playing and just fireworks everywhere yeah um, yeah yeah and then yeah that one stands out to me too i i remember yeah. getting that cd when i was in like seventh or eighth grade i don't know when it was at the time but yeah yeah like early teenage years and yeah coach is such a great song yeah and then uh, uh probably if you, still to this day uh if you watch that video so that's a it's just a performance video that david fincher did and i want to say i want to say i remember looking at the budget and i want to say i think they shot it was before i worked at anonymous and he did he had done it there so i had access to like looking back at budgets and call mm -hmm. sheets and stuff but they shot like seven days i want to say at least if not more and it was and it's in a warehouse and it's a performance and they shot i mean it was literally like play the song you know they lip sync to the song uh -huh. that's how you know videos work and then the artist plays along cut go again, cut, go again for seven days straight. But if you look Oof. at it, it is, it's just performance, but there's not a single, it's the whole thing is amazing. It's like the best performance video ever, because if you shoot that much of just performance, you're, you, you know, like an edit, you're just taking the best of the best of the best. And at that mm. point, you have so much footage to pull from. The best of the best is like unbelievable. So I mean, it's typical David Fincher does the same thing on his movies where, he, you know, he'll do 30 takes of one line before he, the, before the, uh, the actor wants to fist fight him. So yeah, that's got to be it, exhausting. 30 <laughs> talking about these now and you mentioning that time frame too, with like the early 2000s, like late 90s, early 2000s. That was right when I was coming into my teenage years and, yeah. and double digit years. But I remember watching like pop-up video on VH1 or just spending so much time watching music videos. And that feels like a foreign activity to me now. Yeah. I don't just sit down for 30 minutes and watch music videos. That was something totally different back then. Yeah. TRL, like, yeah, I remember, yeah. TRL was amazing. And that was like, that was like, if you could get a video on TRL. And I remember like, I think I worked at, a, I was at Anonymous at the time. We had like four or five videos on for like a couple of weeks in the top 10. It was just like, it felt good. I mean, those weren't my videos. I didn't direct them, but I was, I worked at the company that had made them and with the directors. And I remember it was like so cool. And it was such a big, like, that's where it made music videos feel so big. Cause they would like premiere it and debut it. And there was like screaming fans yeah. and like, it was so, uh, you know, and it was live from not, you know, I wasn't live, but they would do it, you know, from Times Square. And it was like, it just had this feeling that when MTV, MTV abandoned music videos, which I guess they just had the VMAs again. I didn't, I didn't even know they still did those. And I just saw they did it like a, like a few weeks ago. And I was like, I didn't even know they're still doing this. And why? Like, 
they abandoned music videos like years ago. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, it just had this like, you know, when, when they abandoned them, it's sort of all that sort of went out the door. And at the same time, that's when YouTube came in and all the videos started going on YouTube, you know, and so you're, you know, you're, you know, $800,000, $1.6 million music video plays. And then after it, someone videoed their cat falling off a stool in the kitchen and <laughs> the cat falling off the stool in the kitchen is getting more views on their, on their flip camera or their phone. And, you know, and they're getting, you know, they have 2.6 million views and the music video that cost, you know, $1.2 million has, you know, half a million views. So you're a, a, it's a business at the end of the day, record labels looking at a business going, let's just put music to a cat falling off a stool, you know, yeah. <laughs> think how much money we can save. So yeah, but before monetization of YouTube, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And so, and so you left uh, anonymous and that's when you went over to maker. Mm -hmm. And so as that's a great transition, right? Cause that's yeah. just, now, now you started to kind of see YouTube as a platform then monetization, I think, came out, I think, about the same year, 2009. Yep. Um, about that same year. And so now you see that there's this, like, there's cat videos, there's YouTube, there's a business here, and we can find some way in between that. And so explain to us a little bit about Maker Studios and, and why that happened and how you used YouTube. Because obviously our, our entire platform is we, we want to see the YouTubers and why your story is so important is not the fact that you um, have this amazing past of writing treatment for, you know, Beyonce videos and this, all this, but it led you to here and why you saw YouTube being the next platform for the music careers and the everyone out there. So kind of explain to us like how that happened. Yeah. I, again, it's, it kind of goes back to what we talked about again, right place, right time. You know, I, I just, I, as I mentioned, I was writing treatments and I'd written a treatment. Um, I would write treatments with Jake Nava, who was directing, you know, obviously a ton of music videos, but, he, but Beyonce, um, even to this day, I saw that he directed some of that. I am, uh, I think it's I am King, is it the name of, or no, I am Queen? Whatever the Disney, I, I'm blanking on the name, but whatever the Disney thing she just did. Um, he was one of the directors listed. So she's always loved to work with him. So um, he, uh, it came in to, to write a treatment for uh, If I Were a Boy and Single Ladies. And uh, so I was working with him writing treatments at the time. And so he had sent it to me and said, hey, you know, or the EP had said, hey, you know, this is for Jake, you know, get on the phone with them. So I got on the phone with them and we talked about it. And uh, if, if I Were a Boy was the big video. And then, if I, and then Single Ladies was sort of like, they were gonna shoot it as a throw in at the same time, because I think Beyonce was going on tour and they just wanted to knock them out. But so it was like, let's focus on if, I'm, if I were a boy, but then let's also shoot um, uh, single ladies at the same time because we'll have her, she'll be in New York, she's available. We'll, we can just do it all. And they wanted them both black and white. They're like, we just want them black and white. We want both of them. So again, the first thing I did was put the DP on hold for those dates that shoots black and white very well. And, uh, and he ended up shooting him. I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he's amazing at black and white. Um, but so then, um, you know, that's right around YouTube was starting to really start to explode and become more of a, a common thing um, that people were sharing videos and watching videos. Um, so someone had taken this Bob Fosse, who was a 1960s choreographer, um, and he had, his choreography was really famous, and the, mainly, but mainly it was like, you know, these like white women with big beehive hairdos. And someone had taken that, one of his choreographies and put it to uh, this hip hop song called Walk It Out. And strangely enough, it just looked like he choreographed to the song. And it was like, but it didn't make any sense. And that was part of the appeal of the video. It was like these like whitest of white women doing this dance that looked like it went to this like full on hip hop song. Um, <laughs> so the brief for single la ladies was that Beyonce just wanted a dance video. So it's like, okay, well, what do I, you know, if you think about if you're a director and you're going to do a Beyonce video and the, and the brief is she just wants to dance. So you're like, well, what do I even write? Like Beyonce dances? Like you have to write something, you know, like, so yeah. it was like, well, what do we do? Like, you know, where does she dance? What, you know, what's the, what's the theme of it? And it, you know, let's, but it was, it also, she also wanted it very simple. She didn't want like any, like, you know, extravagant, like, you know, like, you know, on a rooftop with helicopters or anything, you know, it was just like a simple, it said simple dance video. So I showed Jake that video. I sent him the link and I was like, just, why don't you just show her this? and see, and I knew, and I knew that she was a big Fosse fan. 
So he sent it to her and he was like, he's like, that's great. I think this is like, uh, this, is, this is perfect. So he sent it to her. She was like, let's do that. And then we just kind of wrote up a treatment saying like, you know, basically what happens with the, there's like that little ramp in it, which was from the Posse video. And, the, and there was three of them. There was three women in the video. They do the hand thing too. So the choreography was like, uh, like almost like, it was almost like a homage to Fosse, which I'm sure she always wanted to do. So it worked out perfect. So that obviously took off on YouTube. Um, and so at the time I was like, you know, first of all, I was like, this is so cool to see um, this video take off like this. I'll, I'll never forget being at the gym and like seeing CNN doing a piece on it while I'm on a <laughs> treadmill. And like, I'm like, this is crazy. Like, this is crazy that this is, and the reason it can get this crazy is because everyone can just share it. Like you mm -hmm. don't have to wait for it to be on TRL. Like, you can just share it. Well, yeah. even the treatment, you 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 shared of even getting to it. Yeah. You shared a video to talk about making the video. It's such a cool instance. Before that, you would have had to, I don't know, what, you couldn't even attach a file that big in an email. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, I mean, there's music videos are always, a lot of them, are, it's always references, like reference photos and reference this. So everything's all, you know, I mean, look, even in uh, movies, every, there's, that, there's that Vimeo channel, everything's a reference and that shows you like the, the, the yeah. references or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's true. So yeah, so I had shown and the reason it started to take off on YouTube originally is because people realized that this was the, the walk it out video that they had kind of like, in a sense, like, you know, recreated in, in like, a, almost like a homage type form. And then it, and then from there, it just obviously just went to a whole other level, obviously, because Beyonce is Beyonce. This people love the song women love the song. It's one of the songs where I say like, I don't think there's anyone that goes like, I think everyone goes like, yeah, I like that. Like, I don't think, I don't care if you like, like death metal, you probably be like, yeah, it's not that bad. You think, see, it's like one of those songs. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so then, you know, it, you know, it, I also like people with the record labels that I knew or friends with knew that I had written that treatment. And then um, I, at the time had been building my reel as a director to, to eventually become a director myself, just go. So I, you know, so I left and I did that. I went out on my own as a director and I signed a, a, a different co production company. Um, I got repped by one of the, the, the reps who was repping the red video directors. Um, and then I met those guys from Maker Studios, which at the time, it was like four guys and they had started this company and it was called, they were calling it Maker. And uh, this friend of mine, Denise Cass, who was actually worked at Anonymous with me, she had started making YouTube videos. And like, I didn't understand why. She would like send them to me or I forget how I would see them, maybe on MySpace or something, I can't remember. But I would watch them and I'd be like, I don't know why she's doing this. Like she, she loved horror movies. So she would try to do these like, you know, it was just like her on her webcam talking about horror movies or like scary stuff or like, hey guys, like, you know, what's your scariest moment? My, let me tell you about mine. And I didn't really understand it. And I was like, I don't know why she does this, but she hit me up one day and she was like, hey, would you want to direct a spoof music video? And I was like, okay. I mean, I was like, I just left Anonymous. Like I was like on unemployment and I was like sometimes working as a director. I was like really trying to really get myself there but I, you know, I was like sure why not like you know she's like yeah my friend has a camera he'll shoot it you could just come you know direct help us I was like yeah that's fine so she gave me the address and I showed up the next day and it was for this um David Guetta Akon song um called Sexy Bitch um but the, they had made a song called Bearded Bitch uh, or Bearded Lady or something um and it was like this guy who was this heavy set guy who had this giant beard who was like the most like the minute you met him you're like okay this guy's like my best friend like he was like this had this personality that just like came off to you like just, and he was like so friendly to everyone just treated everyone the same and like just ha again he has this weird like almost like best friend persona feeling um and there's all these really awkward kids it, it was this house in the valley and i was like this wasn't a big house but it had a pool and there's always like really awkward kids but they're all super fun but they like spent the most of the time they had flip cameras and they would always be like flipping and cameraing themselves and, like and then they'd be like super quiet and nerdy. And then they turn the camera on. They'd be like, hey, hey guys, like, hey, we're all here. Look who's here. And I'm like, I don't know who any of these people are. Um, but they were, <laughs> they were really fun. And we like had a good time. We like laughed and made all these like ridiculous, you know, things and like shot some things where I'm like, this is so ridiculous. I don't know what, who would watch this. Um, they edited it together and they invited me to come see the edit. And I was like, oh yeah, I came by. I went by their little office, which is like in like someone's apartment. And mm -hmm. I watched the edit and I'm like, oh, it's funny. You know, I'm like thinking like, whatever, this is, this old, you know, it's cool, whatever, who cares? So uh, they re they're like, oh, we're going to, we're going to drop it tomorrow. We're going to, you know, put it on YouTube. So a couple of weeks later, I think I looked and it had like almost or over a million views. I can't remember. But it, and at the time, a million views on YouTube was like probably equal to like, like 30 million views today. And it was like yeah. within like a week or two. And I was like, 
So I immediately like called her. I'm like, what is going on here? Like, how did you do this? Like, cause I know at this point, I know major labels, they're all putting their videos on YouTube and they can't get this. Like even for big artists, they can't get this traction. So I'm thinking like, what did they do? Like, how does this work? And she's like, oh, because everyone in that video is a big YouTuber and they all, you know, push towards that video. And I was like, well, first of all, what's a YouTuber? And second of all, like, how do you, what do you mean push? And she's like, they all have channels. So she started giving me all their names and I was writing their names down and then like looking them up and like, going like, oh my God, like, and like the kid's house that we shot at was Shane Dawson. It was his house, I guess, that he had bought for his mom. And I'm thinking like that kid, and I, they said he owned the house, but I didn't really understand why. And at the time he was like, I want to say he was like 18 years old or something. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, how does this 18 year old kid buy a house? Cause then she starts telling me they're making money. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, Shane makes lots of money. That's how he bought that house. And Shay Carl, who's the guy with the beard, she's like, he supports his whole family and he makes videos every day of his life. So I start looking at his videos and I'm like, they're 15 minutes long. It's like him talking about his kids going throughout their day. There's like four edits and it's just like him. Hey guys, hey guys, like all the hey guys stuff. And I'm thinking like, but I'm looking at the views and the subscriber and I'm just like, this is insane. And she starts telling me how much money they're making. And like another guy is like Kasim G who does like interview people on the streets. And he, but he's hilarious and I'm like but I'm, I'm like what is this so she's like yeah that's how they're paying for this company maker and um at first I was kind of like well this sucks like here I am trying to book like a thirty thousand dollar music video so I can make three thousand dollars and work my ass off for like weeks and then months and post and like you know try to shoot on film and like try to like pay people that I can't afford to have because I really want to make it great and like and these guys are like picking up a flip camera <laughs> and editing on iMovie and making, you know, $400,000 a year. I'm like, this is insane. But, you know, it was the, if you can't beat them, join them. So I was like, yeah. okay, well, I, I, I really honestly liked them all. I thought these, I thought I got along with them. I'm like, these guys are really cool. And then I was like, well, they're on to something. They, these guys know something and they're basically creating something that um, no one in Hollywood is even aware of because I wasn't aware of it. And no one I knew even knew about this world. And it was happening in their backyard because they all moved to Venice for whatever reason. They were all living in Venice Beach. Um, and they would move from across the country. Like one would make it and then they'd become friends with another guy who lived in like Idaho. They'd like move out and they had houses where they'd be like seven of them living together. And it was just this whole bizarre world. And then so Maker became Maker, just, you know, based off YouTube. They just kept growing. Like it felt like every two or three months, like we'd be like, oh, now we have a new office. Well, where? It's over here now. And it'd be like twice the size, it'd be twice the people. And it just kept, you know, it was growing and growing and getting just like, and at the time I'm, you know, so I, what I was doing is I was bringing in their branded. I was like, well, I know people that have brands and stuff that could use this. So I was like, I was directing like the higher end, bigger, like spoof music videos. And like, mm -hmm. and then also like trying to like do stuff with brands where like, I'm like, look, you can get in front of their audience and they can, these people can you from more eyeballs than anybody at this point so um you know so we started doing that and we like you know we you, you learn a lot from your failures i never forget we did some i can't think it might, might have been snickers it was some candy bar but we did it and like i forget what the video was but i remember, never forget the kids comments were like i'm never buying snickers ever again like, <laughs> like fuck snickers um, and i was like well i guess that didn't go well um <laughs> yeah, right. and then you learn you're like crap like we have to be very careful because if you pay all this money, you don't want to, if you're a brand, you don't want to read that. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, that's how that, that's how that happened. That, and that was kind of super early to be promoting between YouTubers and brands. And that, now it's common, right? Now you've got hashtag ad and mm -hmm. all of the legalese behind it. Um, yep. But yeah, that was, that was well before that whole trend started. And so what, what are your thoughts on the platform and how, it, how it's grown? Um, it's funny because a lot of the things that we learned and did are still to this day. Um, cause I, I, I get hired to consult all the time from literally from that era, people will be like, you know, Hey, cause it's funny. Everybody wants to like, you know, make a viral video or like, everybody wants to like, how do you, they want to think there's a magic wand. I'm like, there's no magic yeah. wand. So, you know, but there are principles to this day that even like, I, you know, I, I worked for this, my friend has this uh, digital agency and they did a campaign for. Arizona Ice Tea and Arizona Ice Tea wanted to grow on TikTok and I wasn't familiar with TikTok. So I had to go learn and kind of wrap my head around TikTok and figure out why the kids like it. Cause I'm like, I don't get it. It's not for me, but I want to know why and I want to learn. So I like learned it and it's like, okay. And a lot of the same principles that I would use on a campaign like that, 
for some of the stuff we did back then. It's like any, you know, any, anything in life, really. Like, you know, you learn and then there's, there's certain, you know, a sport, a, uh, a career, there's, you know, there's certain things that hold true, certain, you know, ideologies or, or ways you do things that hold through, true, you know, across the board. So there was things we did back then to create, you know, uh, you know, brands having success with using in influencers, which no one used that word at the time. It was YouTubers. Um, cause it really, that's all there was. So, um, um, yeah, so, you know, now it's, it's, it is funny cause I see it now and like, I, I can look at, I, sometimes I see like brands hiring and I'm like, oh, they're paying all these people to do this. And I'm like, but they're, I don't know what they're going to think they're getting out of it because I feel like it's just a miss. Like, you know, um, the message just burn the money because I don't think what they're doing isn't going to work. Cause you know, the, the idea is like, okay, if you have on YouTube, you have 3 million subscribers and your videos get what, like, I mean, what do you, what, what do video, if you have 3 million subscribers, what's the average about? Probably. I, I, I'd probably say they probably have like 35% engagement. So maybe like 1.1 1 .1 on a good, on a good video, maybe, good maybe video, a million yeah. on a really good video, maybe, maybe 10 million. That's the whole thing with YouTube that, sorry, excuse me, that video could get 10,000 views or get 10 million and you, there's no algorithm in the sense of yeah. the, the algorithm is based off of people watching an engagement in your community at first and then engagement with out of your community length of time. There's so many factors that go into yeah. it. I would yeah, say I, like I'm, a million. A million, yeah. So let's say, so people think, okay, this person averages a million views a video. So if we do a video with him, a million people will see our product and that means, you know, so that means, you know, half a million people will buy it and you're like, no, 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 the scale is so different, you know, and then if you take that to other platforms like Instagram, it's even less, you know, like yeah. if you have a million subscribers, you know, and it's funny what you said about YouTube, because that's how even how it was back then. We used to call it online gambling, because sometimes like, like Shay, so he would upload a video every single day. Um, sometimes his videos would go nuts, like it'd be like, you know, two million in the time that was massive or sometimes but even about like 350,000 but like sometimes it was like by like gaming the the, the thumbnail um you know yep. he would like he gamed the he gamed the thumbnail like or, or the title you know like like you know Shay Meek's big booty girls or whatever like that and it would just be like him at the beach and like there was like these girls with big booties and he talked to but that was it um what's his face was the king of it Philip uh what is his name I think he still does well now um, they've added a factor into the algorithm that is watch time yeah so before it was like click if you click that video and that's clickbait obviously came in yep. you click the video then you had your view count go up but now now they've put into the factor of if, you're, if your video is 15 minutes and you're only getting 22 seconds of the video you're you're not the algorithm won't pick you up yeah that i went to a seminar a couple, few years ago a youtube seminar um and they had they were just announcing that and um it was to discourage that so it's philip defranco he that guy made so mm -hmm. much money by using a kardashian thumbnail he, and so he, his show i don't know if you're philip with uh, familiar with philip but he would just like do the news he'd be like you know mm -hmm. today so and so and then he'd mention like you know kim kardashian bought a new car but the thumbnail would be like kim kardashian shocking news you know and it'd be a picture <laughs> of her um and he and he get so much views off of it but um yeah so that the reason youtube did that was to aid to discourage that but also part of it was to discourage the v people trying to make viral videos because they showed us like a, uh, a chart of viral videos. So, and it makes total sense. Like, you know, I can't even count how many times, like in that time, like when I was working with Maker that people would ask me like record labels, be like, hey, we want this video to be viral. I'm like, oh yeah, who doesn't? Like, does, you know, like who doesn't <laughs> want their video millions of views? Like, that's not like, you can't, I can guarantee it X amount of views. Cause even as I was directing music videos, I, when I was working at Maker, we, I would, we tested this a couple of times, we, I would, get them to spend an extra little money and we would push the music video like i would like i, I remember i cast nikki limo in a video and then the label paid her and then paid her extra to promote the video which again like nobody was doing at the time um she was like hey on her channel she was like hey i'm in this music video if you all want to go see it and it drove of course drove views but um mm -hmm. what i was gonna say so they they were trying to also discourage people just trying to make the one-off hit because you can't just sustain it like you know like the gangnam style guy or like chocolate yeah. rain back in the day like <laughs> you can't sustain once you hit you, you go viral you don't there's nowhere to go but down like you can't keep mm -hmm. keep because you because the part of the part of a viral video is it's never intended you know like no one knows they're going to make a viral video you know um you just make it and it goes viral the so, only um, person who can is mark rober 
Yeah. He, you know him? He, he, <laughs> yeah. The, there's so many videos on him of like breaking the algorithm because he only makes, I think, 12 videos a year and every one of his videos has like eight and a half million views. Yeah. The pressure on that though. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. they'll eventually try to figure out how to work them out. So that algorithm is also how um, YouTube Prime works as well. So because um, okay. our, our movie and 2 C is on, on Prime now and that's exactly how it works. Like it's so if you know if I watched it for 30 minutes and then and then and then Drew you watched it for another like 20 like it still counts as like it it counts as like a full view I guess which creates hmm. the CPM oh um, which okay is, I guess similar because that's how YouTube explained it I don't know if they're still doing this but how it would work is like if I went to your channel like if I watched Mike's like video and then like I clicked out of it but it led me to your channel then he would still get counted part of a CPM for me watch even though I watch more videos on your channel for because he led me there yeah I would interesting get like, yeah i would get i would get like my cpm a little higher or something like that huh. so yeah wow. well that, i mean we didn't get to talk about the video or the documentary um oh, right. that, but i will promise round three will be documentary <laughs> and the future of what you want to do because i think what you want to do after you know your next major project that we kind of had talked about um ties into both it'll be a really cool tie into both episodes. So, um, but dude, thank you so much that You're the stories yeah, that you have always blow me away. You're <laughs> just the amount of, the amount of sheer knowledge you have of the music video industry is it, it's, you have your tenure in it, man. It's like, it's crazy, crazy cool to like yeah, I had, your mind at work is awesome. I had two ongoing thoughts through most of this interview. The first one was, man, there's so much new stuff that, we're talking about now that we did in the first time. So I'm sure yeah. we could go into episode three real easily. But the second thing was <laughs> stop thinking about the Mark Hamill joke. Cause that was hilarious. Gosh, I, no, I, I, for those five, 10 minutes after you told that joke, seriously, I had to <laughs> remind myself, stop thinking about it. Stop thinking about it. I can't believe I literally wiped that from my brain. And I think what it was, okay. So I watched Saturday night at my daughter's five. And so we watched um, return of the Jedi she was wearing a stormtrooper costume. I'm like, oh, let's watch it. So we watched it. And I think that helped. I think talking about Sequest and watching that <laughs> triggered it in my brain. I can't believe, I just, I remember my nephew is like a huge Star Wars fan. I don't think I've ever told him that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I literally forgot about it. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I say, I, my son's name is Luca. And I was like, Luca, I am your father. Your father, yeah, perfect. <laughs> but, but definitely not on the set. That is so. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And like, I. I it just it literally just popped out of my mouth. I remember as it <laughs> popped out, I just was thinking like, oh my God, oh my God. Like, like this is the dumbest thing you could say, the worst thing. It left, it was like that. And, and there was that, that I don't, it might've been just like a really brief pause of silence, but like the whole place was. <laughs> oh, we lost you for a second. State. Oh yeah, just but I was just saying it just stayed silent for it felt like forever in my brain. But then everyone laughed and then he laughed and I was like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> I feel like if that were me, that'd be one of those things that I would have played inside my head, just imagining it beforehand. Like, what if I got the chance to say some snarky <laughs> comment to Mark Hamill one day? And then like that opportunity came and just instinct kicks in. You're, you're just like blurred it and then you're like, Oh wow. That's yeah. so funny. That's such a great story. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to do episode three, I might make it a trilogy. Let me know. Yeah, we, we might as well. Well, we we were talking about this before we hopped on, but 110%. We can do it while we're hanging out after we're all surfed out in uh, yeah. Waco. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'd great. be cool. We can all do it in the same room. Yeah. 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 So, hey, man, I appreciate the time. And uh, as always, you know, we appreciate the uh, the friendship that we've started. And it's awesome. It's such a great yeah. time to be able to hang out with you. And we look forward to actually being able to see you in person um maybe yeah. in florida or texas or la we'll find a we'll find a way for sure yeah i think what you guys are doing are great like that's i know you guys are focusing on youtube but also you know obviously cj is not a youtuber but you so you did his story but like you know i think you being a branching out a little bit but just like they're like in youtube like like there's so many and there's so many stories like those people that i started with like like a lot of times i'm like i wonder i don't even know what they're doing now i know a lot of mm -hmm. them got made a shitload of money when maker sold so they're probably doing anything, but like, yeah, I'm like yeah. the shelf life on that and just like how it happens and how it doesn't happen is it's, I mean, it's a phenomenal subject. So mm -hmm. I think if you guys keep pushing in that direction and telling these stories, like it'll, you know, it's, 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 it's not, you're not just like, Hey, I'm doing a podcast. Like you guys have an agenda and an objective. So it's like, yeah. I think, uh, I think, which is the key. Cause so many people nowadays are like, Hey man, I want to come on my podcast. I'm like, what's it about? And they're like, 
yeah, just, we just talk. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> we got enough of that, you know, like, so we, we I think, just uh, talk too, but we want to, we want to help to inspire the next generation of children to say, yeah. Hey, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't have that moment in my brain until I sat down and Britney Spears was on the TV yeah. and I'm, there's an industry for music videos. And I love that. I'm going to chase that. And yeah. you tell your story and say, look, that when that clicks in your head, follow your dream, follow your passion and you can, you can do it. You know, that's yeah. really the whole goal. That's what we want. Yeah. So. That's smart. Yeah, these yeah. stories end up acting as pretty cool blueprints, really like just showing kids that you can make this happen. It's yeah. possible. Yeah. Like and that's yeah. the beauty of YouTube is that I, I forget who it was that we interviewed that said it, but you watch YouTube and you think I can do that. Yeah. It was, it was actually Justin on our, on round one. He yeah. said yeah. the number yeah. one, the number one YouTubers, so. um, the only reason they make it so big is because they make it seem like anyone can do it. Yeah. That's part yeah. of the secret sauce. And it's true. Yeah. That's, I mean, it really puts, I mean, YouTube put the tools in everyone's hand, you know, yeah. like, because yeah. the distribution was the one thing like you could go get a camera you could go shoot something make it really nice but you couldn't distribute it to the world and now you can yeah yeah so, yeah. yeah it's yeah. the distribution so it's the main yeah. piece so yeah um, oh man i appreciate yeah. the time we'll link yeah. uh, Thanks, we'll link his social in there he's got some awesome pictures he's a great photographer as well we didn't even talk about that mm -hmm. um and uh you, you definitely check out his documentary it was amazing I've watched it, I've listened to it, and I highly suggest you guys get into it. We'll link to it on Amazon um, in, the, in the bio. So thanks a lot, man. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks,